Greetings, everybody. Derek DeBras here, Attorney Derek DeBras, Munitions Law Group, MunitionsGroup.com. Please like us on all social media. Go ahead and hit that little bell icon. Make sure you follow us here on YouTube. Drop any comments you may have in the comment section. We'll try to get them into the queue and answer them as soon as possible. We're going to continue to bring you guys uh, material, try to bring you in a lot more current events. My associate Michael is going to be bringing you a case law update here real soon. But today I wanted to, as I've um, kind of alluded to in the last couple of weeks, uh, get on a uh, video here and just kind of go over gun trust again. Um, nothing necessarily overly new. Um, I've kind of hit all the updates on NFA issues that have been arising in the news with regards to arm braces and such over the last uh, year. But uh, I did want to touch base as things are getting warmer. We're getting a lot more calls about people wanting to get into the NFA market as they get ready for the shooting season outdoors. Um, so with that said, let's just jump right in. Um, so what is a gun trust? Many of you know what it is. Um, it's a estate planning tool first and foremost. Uh, back uh, when what I call NFA trust first kind of came into the market, a lot of people would get those just because they could avoid uh, what's known as the CLIO requirement or chief law enforcement officer. So historically, if I wanted to own a fully automatic machine gun, a suppressor, otherwise known as a silencer, a short barrel rifle or short barrel shotgun, uh, I had to get the sheriff to sign basically a permission slip. Um, now, that's now changed, but traditionally I had to, but trust did not. So what really kind of gave rise to that market was this uh, avoidance of the sheriff. Uh, as a lawyer, though, I've always viewed this as a much more sophisticated tool than just, oh, I need to avoid the sheriff. I'm going to go out and get this. And I had so many clients that would come to me and they would get these trusts and I'd ask about their will and they might be in their 40s and have kids and a wife. And this was more important to them than planning their estate. I had a very close friend of mine who did that and then I unfortunately ended up dying of a a uh, heart defect of all things. He was a law enforcement officer and um, he never got his estate done, but uh, we were able to handle it for the family. But in any event, um, I do think that when we think about NFA trust and gun trusts overall, we need to think about it from an estate planning standpoint. Um, the good news for those of you out, that are out there that are married and your spouse doesn't, spouse doesn't necessarily like firearms or have an interest in firearms, this is a good way to uh, get that spouse on board and saying, hey, let's get our overall estate plan done. And we do package wills and family trusts in, in, in conjunction with a gun trusts as well. So over the years, um, our trust planning services for gun owners has changed and it's now been relegated really to three types of trusts. And the most expensive is what we call a um, uh, asset protection trust. Ohio, it's been about 10 years now, I think since we passed the law, does have what we call a self-settled asset protection trust. It's generally for people with millions of dollars in guns. Um, it's, it's something that's extremely s uh, sophisticated. Uh, we normally bring in another firm uh, to help with the tax planning portion of it because there's some tax consequences to uh, this type of trust. So it's not very flexible, but it gives you the greatest amount of protection of protecting your assets from people that might be suing you and trying to get asset to your ass assets. So this is beyond NFA in a lot of ways. Um, and then the most common two are what I call the NFA trust, which we'll talk about primarily today, and then the collector's trust. So let's talk about the collector's trust first. Collector's trust is for your non-NFA items. Uh, you can put NFA items into the same trust. I generally don't recommend it, um, giving records to the ETF to get your NFA purchases approved. Um, you know, they may have a record now of your non-registered or non-NFA guns, rather. Uh, we don't want to create that de facto registry. And quite honestly, ETF's not entitled to see the document, in my opinion, of uh, your other assets. So we always bifurcate them or create them in two separate trusts. And if you do them both with our office, it's a buy one, get one free. So you're not paying any necessarily anymore. Uh, but with in regards to the collector's trust, it, it handles things such as disabilities. What if I go to a nursing home? Uh, we have red flag provisions in there now that we have in there to uh, assist with dealing with a red flag incident. Um, just a variety of things. Um, we put trust protectors in there in case you're out of, out of the country and there's a law that changes and you need to change the trust but you're not home to do it. The trust protector can do that. Um, just all kinds of things that really try to handle the what ifs of the regulatory environment that guns uh, naturally are. And then we have the NFA trust. Now, traditionally, when we hear the term gun trust, it's what people are referring to. I've been doing these for my entire career. Um, and the gist of it is, is that, hey, there's no snake oil here, right? Um, there is, in the law books, nothing called a gun trust. It's a trust that is designed by the attorney, hopefully with a knowledgeable skill level of firearms, um, to accept, hold, preserve, and manage that asset. And that specific asset, firearms, whether what we call GCA or Gun Control Act guns, your normal everyday guns, or your NFA guns, National Firearms Act guns, which are highly regulated. 
So it's still very much an estate planning tool. Um, it does not avoid the sheriff because no longer is that required. In 2016, I think it was Rule 41F uh, was made um, essentially, um, I wouldn't say law, but it was an executive action by President Obama. And essentially what it did was, historically, you never had to get the sheriff to sign off. You never had to get fingerprinted as a trustee of a trust. You never get photographed. Well, Obama changed all that. But he gave us one good thing. You don't have to get permission from the sheriff anymore. And if you look at this historically, it makes sense. This is the first gun control law in our country, 1934. Uh, and, you know, when you wanted to buy one of these firearms, which, by the way, were generally uh, uh, regulated because of the Al Capone, uh, St. Valentine's Day massacre and all the uh, gangland shootings that were happening during Prohibition. Uh, so if you wanted to own one of these, you had to pay the tax, which, by the way, with inflation, it's like four or $5,000 a day, and they've never adjusted the tax for inflation. So you think about this back in the 30s and 40s, if you wanted to own one of these, it's like a month's salary to somebody who was making a good living, a very good living. So it was almost cost prohibitive for most people. Um, but you would go ahead and you would, you would purchase one of these guns, and you'd have to fill out some paperwork, pay the tax, and that would get approved by ATF. Well, back then, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have background checks. The NIC system wasn't even a thought. Uh, so, you know, they required the sheriff to sign off. And theoretically, the sheriff knew the bad actors. So the, the sheriff could, you know, get involved and get those guns denied if they needed to. Um, but fast forward to today, and one, we're extremely transient society. Two, the sheriff hardly knows everybody in his or her county, especially in the more metropolis counties and cities. Uh, and three, it's become a political whip, right? So uh, for years when I uh, was a young attorney, uh, if I lived in Franklin County, which I did, if I didn't have a trust, I wasn't going to get the sheriff to sign off because the sheriff was a Democrat, and that just wasn't how that sheriff, particular sheriff would win votes. Um, but if you were in a more conservative county, the sheriff would sign off. So um, Obama did away with that requirement. Now it's no longer certification by the CLIO. It's now notification. So you have to send them a copy of your applications and that's it. And what happens to those in Ohio, I'm really not certain to be quite honest with you. I know some states have passed laws saying the sheriff has to destroy them. I think Florida may be one of those. Don't quote me on that. Um, but that's all you have to do. I do recommend they get sent certified so that there is proof that it was received and sent. Um, and then <clears throat> as far as the trust is concerned, you... You don't need the sheriff to sign off. You still have to submit the application. And now all trustees under that rule uh, are what the law calls responsible parties. So I call them trustees because that's how I've drafted my trust. But depending on how the attorney drafts the trust, you want to make sure that the beneficiaries are not responsible parties because they could be children. Um, so only the people with the uh, direct or indirect control to manage the policies and, and directives of the trust are considered responsible parties. And that's typically a trustee. Not a successor trustee, not a beneficiary, but a trustee. So the trustees will have to get fingerprinted. They'll have to get photographed. And they have to fill out a new form called a Form 23. So that'll go in with the Form 4, which is the regular application. Um, that needs to be filled out when you're asking for permission to uh, transfer a, a, a NFA item. Um, the trust itself, it can be drafted in any which way you want, as long as it's a valid trust. And any state that's following the Uniform Trust Code those are very few requirements. And in fact, an Ohio trust does not need to even technically be in writing. No other way to prove it to the ATF. Um, and by the way, if you ever get correspondence from the ATF talking about your trust declaration, that's the trust itself. Uh, the trust itself is actually an agreement between the grantor or settlor and the trustee. Uh, kind of like if you and I shake hands and we agree, I'm going to sell you my car for $600 and it's not in writing. Still a contract. It's just not in writing. Same thing with a trust. Um, but what the ATF does require is a trust declaration to be in writing. So your main parties in the NFA trust are going to be the grantor or settler. It's the same thing. Sometimes also called a trustor. Essentially, it's the creator of the trust. And then you'll have a trustee, which is the fiduciary who manages the trust. And then you'll have a beneficiary. In addition to that, you also have some successor trustees that step in to serve in the event there is no trustees to serve. Um, so what happens essentially is when you buy your gun, you're going to get a series of forms. You're going to get a Form 4 if it's already on the registry. If you're going to make your own gun, which you can other than machine guns, you can make your own silencers, arguably. I'll come back around on that soon, but most typical gun that's made is an SBR. You buy an 8-inch barrel. You buy an AR-15 lower. You want to connect the two. In order to do so, you got to register the gun. Now, when you register a gun on what's called a Form 1, it means you're making the gun. You have to engrave the name 
uh, city and state of the owner. So that would be the name of the trust, which is why we keep our trust names exceptionally short in case we have to engrave a gun. Um, as far as suppressors are concerned, it wasn't until recently uh, that I've, I've had clients and even friends who have done this that they're going to build their own suppressors. Now, it might seem kind of crazy to some of you, um, but there's a lot of engineers out there that like guns and they know how to do this stuff. Um, so when you file a Form 1 and say, hey, I'm going to build a suppressor, ATF has now been corresponding back and say, well, how are you going to make it? Because the way the definition is made in the, the uh, National Firearms Act and in the Gun Control Act, it includes any part of a suppressor as well that's designed or intended to be made into a fully functional suppressor. So if I start with a, a kit, if you will, of these baffles that are sold to me, well, the baffle itself could be considered a suppressor. I'm already in a legal possession of it because it's not registered. So it's kind of cart and horse situation. Um, but with regards to the SBRs and things like that, just keep in mind you do have to get it uh, approved and then you have to engrave it. So you'll file a Form 4 if it's already on the registry or Form 1 if it's not on the registry and you're making the gun yourself. If it's through a trust, then you're also going to file the Form 23s with that. That's for every trustee that's currently serving to fill out. Every trustee or responsible person will need two fingerprint cards, FD-258 fingerprint cards, and they'll need a uh, passport size photo that goes on the Form 23. That all gets sent in with a copy of the trust, and then a period of time later, they'll send it back uh, with approval of the stamps. The stamps actually get sent to the person who the gun is coming from if you're not making it. So if I'm buying it from a dealer, the dealer will get the stamps and call me up. Um, I have heard uh, anecdotally from my clients that uh, individual purchases are almost same day turnaround on suppressors at least. Um, ATF is working on speeding up the trust transfer process. I highly recommend uh, gun trust or even an entity to hold a, a gun for a variety of reasons. One is the state planning feature first and foremost. I get hired all the time to put NFA items through probate process and it's expensive because we're not only dealing with the local court, we're also dealing with the federal government and their timelines don't always do this. They more, you know, they conflict more than anything. Um, you know, ATF might take a year to process something. The court wants the case closed out in a few months. Now, there have been opportunities for me to speed things up with the ATF if there's an extenuating circumstances, but that's the exception to the rule, not the rule. So keep that in mind. So the state planning feature is exceptionally important, um, not only from a time standpoint, getting things through the court system, but also just keeping things out of court entirely so it's not public record. Uh, the second benefit is multiple possessors. I can have multiple trustees to possess these items. If I'm an individual, I'm the only one that legally can possess them. Possession is dominion and control. So if I'm living with a roommate and I leave the machine gun on the table and the roommate's sitting right by it, or it could be argued that he's in possession or she's in possession of the gun. So we'd want to put that person on my trust as a trustee. And then the third, and I think the most important um, over the years of experiencing this uh, item for doing a gun trust, or reason for doing a gun trust rather, is the unknown. Uh, I had a client once that got charged with a, a misdemeanor and part of the, the deal was he couldn't possess guns. Well, he had NFA guns registered his individual name. He's like, Derek, what do I do? Well, I mean, can't give them to law enforcement. You can't give them to an individual. You can't give them to a dealer. It's all legal. You have to get the paperwork filed and that takes months. Um, he ended up getting it resolved another way. I'm not exactly sure how. I didn't represent him in the criminal case, but um, I told him, you know, if you had put these in a trust like I originally told you, this would have been a lot easier because all we would have to have done is added another trustee, told the ATF we're moving the guns to the other trustee's house, and then that's it. Now, maybe remove him from the trust, maybe not. It just depends on the nature of the situation, but it gives us a lot more flexibility to do things immediately. I'm not saying that everybody should be expecting that they're going to commit a crime in them li their lives and find themselves in this position, but other things can happen. What if you're, you're losing your faculties and your mental acuity is not all there? A trust can really assist with who's possessing those guns at any given time. So I hope this was been this has been helpful as a pre uh, or I'm sorry as an update to the gun trust discussion that we've had over the years. If anybody has any questions, always happy to uh, have a consult on gun trust matters free of charge. So just give us a call, shoot a comment in the comments box and comments box. Sorry, and as always, be safe and carry on.